In this episode of the Blender Compositor Beginner Course, we're going to be taking a look at a few more nodes to create some new effects for our image. These include the bilateral blur node and a comparison between that and the traditional blur node, as well as learning how we can use the glare node to create some additional lighting effects for our image. That and more is coming up in episode 4. Now if you want to follow along with this six part series using your own projects, you are more than welcome to do so. However, if you are looking to use the project that we are using for this series, then you can download it via the link in the video description. But not only will you be getting all of the assets related to our project, if you sign up you will also get access to our free Blender 2.8 PDF cheat sheet full of keyboard shortcuts that are commonly used in Blender for things like navigating the 3D viewport, creating animations, manipulating nodes in the compositor etc as well as some of our top tips and tricks for making the most of your Blender experience and improving your workflow. On top of that you will also have access to our bi-weekly newsletter for the latest information on all things related to Blender. The first thing that we are going to cover in this video is how to reroute the connections between nodes. For example, in our current setup, we have the transform node here and its image output that is directly connected to the image input of the alpha over node here. However, the connection lies behind the blur and ellipse mask nodes, which have no relationship to this connection. What we need to do here to make things appear less confusing is to reroute this connection. To do that, I'm going to hold Shift and A on my keyboard to bring up the Add menu, then make sure I select Layout and then Reroute. Now I can position this reroute point anywhere in my editor. I'm going to position it about here and then what I can do is I can grab the image output and plug it in to this new reroute point. Then I can take the reroute point and plug it directly into the alpha overs image input. This way it becomes easier to see which nodes are connected to each other. Now at this point I want to start from scratch before looking at any other nodes and the main reason why is because I don't want the setup to appear too complex. What we're going to do is we're going to take pretty much all of these nodes with the exception of the viewer node and the image node and we are going to create a group for all of these nodes and just set them to one side rather than deleting them. I'm going to first of all select all of the nodes that I want including their frames. Then we're going to hit Control and G to position all of these nodes inside a group. We're going to label this as first composite and then press enter and then let's come out of this node tree to the parent node tree and just zoom in and this is our node group so we're going to update the name here as well to first composite And then I'm just going to deconnect all of these nodes because at this point 
I want to start from scratch and that means just positioning this over here and let's bring our viewer node closer in and once again connect up the combined output with the image input to get what is our original image. For this video our main focus is going to be on some of the filter nodes that we can use and the first one I want to preview is going to be the filter node itself. So I'm going to go shift and A, go to filter and select filter. Then plug the filter node into here by left clicking. Give that a second to composite. And at the moment it's set to soften. But before we preview the options here, there is one old node that I would like to bring back and that's going to be the denoise node, which, as you may be aware, is also found in the filter menu. So let's bring back that denoise node and plug it in here. Then we're going to connect the albedo and the denoising normal. At the moment I have snapping still turned on but I don't really need it to be turned on at this moment in time so we're going to just turn snapping off and now let's turn our attention back to this filter node which is currently set to soften and when set to this it does exactly what you would imagine it does it softens the image so it basically softens the edges of each object if we left click here we can see we have a variety of options the next one is the sharpen option I'm just going to zoom in on the dodgeball so I'm going to select the viewer node and if I hold down the alt key and then press V I can zoom in on my image in the actual editor if I change the filter node to sharpen and allow that to composite the edges around all of the objects in our scene become much more visible this does however create some artifacts around those edges what we can do is we can reduce the factor value to reduce the influence of this specific node if we reduce it down to around 0.27 for example we still have that sharpening effect but it's not as strong and we don't get as much additional noise around the edges we also have some other options we're going to just preview these quickly many of them are quite similar to each other we have first of all Laplace and I'm just going to let each one composite and bring the values of the factors back up to one so that you can see exactly what's going on here with a factor value set to one it creates this almost neon like effect and we can get similar results with some of the other options here so we have Sobel we have Prewit we have Kirsch and we have shadow now shadow itself does work very differently to the ones that come before it but with this one in particular I do find that you really need if you're going to use it a low factor value some of these require a very subtle factor value and depending on what you want some of them like Kirsch for example can work very well with higher factor values if this is the sort of abstract look that you're going for now this image is actually really interesting in its current state there's a lot of detail and effects here that would be extremely difficult to achieve through the initial process of modeling materials and lighting 
we're going to save this image or at least I'm going to save this image because I actually really like the look of this image and you will see that I am still using the .exr format so I'm going to come up here to change that to PNG I'm going to name this as Neon Dodgeball press enter and then save as image before going any further I don't want to have to repeat that process of changing my file format I am instead going to change it one final time here in the output because we no longer need the EXR file so we're going to change the file format from open EXR multi-layer back to PNG that way the next time we want to save an image we know that we can save that image as a PNG. With the image saved I'm now going to delete our filter node and replace it with a bilateral blur node. Now remember if you are using the node wrangler add-on you can make sure that the node is selected hold shift and then press S go to filter and then we're going to select bilateral blur we can see the effect that it already has on our scene but I want to compare this to the regular blur node which means we're going to select both of these so hold down the shift key and select the viewer node and we can use a split viewer node but I just prefer to use two viewer nodes for something like this hold shift D bring these two duplicates down select bilateral blur hit shift s and change it to a blur node and plug the image output into the image input of the blur node now i can select the viewer node that i want to be visible in the background let's zoom in on these two nodes we are already aware of how the blur node works and how we can use the X and Y values to increase the blur let's recap on that by changing these values to a value like 25 let that composite and we can see just how much blur that creates but bilateral blur works just a little bit differently to what normal blur does it has some different options if we select this viewer node to preview bilateral blur we first of all have iterations so we can perform the calculations of this node over and over depending on how many iterations we set if we were to increase this to free for example the blur effect would repeat itself three times I normally do set this value to one unless I'm setting these two values the color sigma and space sigma down to much lower values the color sigma here indicates the threshold of the different colors in the image and basically tells the node and tells blender where the edges should go based on the colors of the image the space sigma on the other hand focuses on the radius of the blur itself for example if we reduce the space sigma down to a very low value say 0.1 we are considerably reducing the radius of the blur that means in this case the blur is a lot less visible as a result of the reduction of the space sigma value if we increase this value to something extremely high then the image itself becomes extraordinarily blurred because the radius is almost overlapping itself in places so it's almost like increasing the iterations if you set this value up really high but you don't really want to use it that way if you want to increase the iterations you simply have the iterations value here in most cases you can set the value anywhere between 0.1 and 5 to get the results that you are looking for so if you want less blur you can use a very low value for the space sigma 
but if you want more blur then you can use a higher value such as 4. Now I am going to actually turn this back to its default value of 5 and bring your attention to this bottom input here which is the determinator. Now this is where things get interesting with the bilateral blur node. The determinator effectively helps you to locate where edges are in your image based on one of these outputs. For example, we could take this normal output and plug it into the determinator. Have a look at what happens to the image in the background. So allow it to composite and then you'll be able to see that the blur is still in effect but with the dodgeball in particular the edges appear very sharp. If we have a look at the normal output itself by plugging it in directly to our viewer node then you can see that the variations in colour here help to impact how this output affects the bilateral blur. So let's plug this back into the bilateral blur and then plug the image into the image input. And then let's have a look at a few of these other options to see if one of them can give us an even better result. So let's try, let's see if alpha does anything. So first of all, just plug the alpha into the viewer to see if we get anything. We don't get anything there. And if you don't see anything that you think might help you with the blur, then it's probably not going to help. If we try the depth, for example, plug that into the image, we get a little bit here, so we get some black and white values. We can test this by plugging it in. Oh, I plugged it into the wrong one there. Hit Control and Z to undo and then let's plug it into the determinator and then the viewer node and that as we can see does help to sharpen the edges that we could also see when we preview the depth output itself. Let's see if any of the other outputs can give us some better results so we have shadow we have ambient occlusion, let's plug the ambient occlusion, see what that does. We've tried the normal, let's try the vector this time, see if that has any impact on our blur. That one in particular doesn't seem to have much of an impact. If we plug it in directly, just to confirm, we actually get no data from this one at all. So it's not going to impact the bilateral blur if it doesn't show up here on its own. And it seems as though the best option for me might actually be to use the depth output. And to help us out a bit, we can come to the bilateral blur node itself and reduce this to a lower value. So let's go 0.1 and press enter. That's going to dramatically reduce the radius of the blur. So now we do have the bilateral blur present, but it's not going to be as strong on the edges of the dodgeball or the cone, thanks to the data that has been supplied by the depth render pass. If we compare the bilateral blur at this point to the regular blur node, then we will be able to see if I can select the viewer node correctly, that the blur node has its effect evenly distributed across our entire render, whereas the bilateral blur, we are able to determine where the main edges are in our render and minimize the effects of the blur around those edges. The next one that we're going to demonstrate is going to be the glare node. What we're going to do is we're going to take our bilateral blur, our regular blur and this viewer node and we're going to delete those three nodes, plug the denoise back into the viewer and then we get our denoised image. Next go shift and A go down to where it says filter and this time select glare. 
we'll plug glare into this connection let that composite and wonder why nothing's happening well the reason why nothing's happening is glare when it's brought into a setup has a threshold value of one let's zoom in so that we can see our glare node clearly we have this threshold value and we need to reduce the threshold value in order to get the glare in our scene let's take that value and first of all let's set it to zero so the value is opposite to what it normally is by default and you can see now that the scene appears to be much brighter we even get these this sort of streak effect where we have the brighter colors so we have this bright yellow circle in front of the red background that is the rest of the dodgeball and that contrast is helping to create these visible streaks it's not as visible elsewhere in the image but you can see where the colors are brightest so for example where our cone is we almost get this sort of halo effect coming around the cone and even in other parts of our scene to a lesser extent if we were to increase this threshold we would decrease the amount of blur in our scene and as we hover over the threshold you can see the descriptor there which pretty much tells you all you need to know about the threshold so the glare filter will only be applied to pixels brighter than this value so if a specific pixel has a numerical value higher than 0.1 in terms of its brightness then it's going to receive the glare effect this way you can isolate the glare to the brighter parts of your scene specifically by setting it up to say 0.5 for example most of the scene has no glare present but the very bright colors so once again the cone as well as the yellow circle on the dodgeball they still have glare in effect because their values are brighter than 0.5 above it we have this mix value now this mix value is set between minus one and one at the moment it's set to zero if we set this all the way to a value of one and allow that to composite then we end up with the processed effects only so it says processed image but we can't actually see our image what we are looking at instead is the effect based on what our threshold is if we increase the threshold then we will begin to reduce what is visible in our scene because the mix value is set to one so if i set the threshold to point 0.9 for example we can now only see this red reflection here which we actually couldn't see before at all and also if we look down here in the viewer node the pure white lines which are the brightest parts of this image are the only things that are still visible that means that we'd have to reduce the mix to a value where we can see the rest of our scene and just by going down to 0 0.9 we begin to see the scene again because it's not set to one anymore if we set the threshold back up to one then that's basically telling blender to not apply glare to the image if we set this all the way to one then only the white bits which have a value a brightness value equal to one itself are visible because we have set both the threshold and the mix to one I'm going to set this back to 0.5 for the threshold let that load up and then you can see everything that is being affected by the glare now if I was to reverse this back from 1 to minus 1 it will apply the opposite which means there is no glare effect whatsoever in our image now for example a good way of mixing these two together to get the effect that you want is to find the parts of the image that you want to highlight so a threshold of 0.5 is a good value because at one it allows me to highlight the cone for some glare 
but it's obviously too high a value because I still want to see the rest of my scene which means I'm going to use a value just above one so maybe 0.2 and then press enter and with this the rest of the image doesn't quite begin to darken just yet but it is beginning to focus more on the glare so let's increase that to 0.3 let's see how that looks maybe 0.4 that looks better so now once we get to point four maybe point five the glare itself becomes much more vibrant compared to the background but we've spent a lot of time talking about these two values these are the main two values that i tend to use first off before i look at anything else so we actually have the type of glare up here we're currently set to streaks but we can go to ghosts for example let that composite and in this case when we set it to ghosts it's a very blurry effect it's almost as if we can see reflections hence the name ghosts of the cone you might be able to see right here we can see a reflection of the cone if we change this to fog glow which i know is many people's favorite then it creates a fog glow effect. I'm just going to reduce the threshold for this one so that we can get a better look at the glow. And actually that's too far. Let's push that back to 0.4. And actually here setting the threshold value below 0.5 gives us some artifacting in the glare that we're not quite looking for. But again, you can play about with these values. So maybe it's a case of reducing the mix value, for example. Maybe you might get something that looks a bit better. So that actually does look a bit better. Then we can reduce the threshold, see what we get with our fog glow. And I don't know about you, but I can begin to see the effect around our cone in particular. But let's just move on to the last one, which is simple star, which is similar to the streaks option however it kind of creates like a star pattern for its glare rather than just regular streaks now i'm just going to go back to the streaks option and you'll notice that we have a few other options here such as iterations so we can play about with the iterations you can go up to a maximum of five for this and that will just increase the overall strength of the glare you can also here increase the number of streaks so i can increase it up to a maximum of 16 and if you pay particular attention to this yellow circle here you can see that there are many more streaks coming out it actually looks almost like the sun if you were to squint your eyes at the sun and you see the sun's rays that's what it kind of begins to look like now we could spend more time going through all of these different options and seeing how they work but i think it's better to just leave you to test out which of these options that you like to use best so i think we're going to end it there for this video and in the next video we're going to be using the glare node along with some other filter nodes in order to get some interesting effects with our title image which will be making a comeback in the next video so thanks guys and i hope to see you there thanks for watching guys if you are interested in learning more about blender then feel free to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter which gives you updates on all things Blender, including future releases of Blender, tips and tricks on how to use some of your favorite tools, recommendations for things like tutorials, courses, as well as things like add-ons or websites that can improve your Blender experience. So thanks guys, and I hope to see you in the next video.